right. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Glassman with the firm here at Panache and Boyle. I want to welcome you all uh, to this morning's press conference. Thank you for taking the time to be here. We appreciate it. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce to you our partners in this case. We have Bob Mongaluzzi and Jeff Goodman here. They are uh, maritime lawyers who specialize in cases like this. They've handled a number of high profile limit, limitation liability cases like this one, including most recently the duck boat cases out of uh, Branson, Missouri. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Bob here, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the case, a little bit about today's filing, and uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> today, uh, we have filed claims uh, on behalf of four of the victims who were killed in this terrible tragedy. Uh, they are Ali Kurtz, Yulia Krashenaya, Kastub Nirmal, and Sanjiri Dia Pajuri. Their families have asked us to do two things to find out what happened and to make sure it never happens again. This devastating fire took place in the early morning hours of September 2nd, killing 34. In what could only be described as cruel and heartless, Truth Aquatics Inc. went to court seeking a judgment saying that these lives were worthless on September 5th before many of the bodies had been found, identified, and before these families could mourn. This was a heartless, callous act which inflicted further pain on these families. This actor had six months to file that claim, but chose to do it immediately, lawyering up without any concern whatsoever for the people that they've killed. Uh, they have filed a limitation of liability action. Uh, that is uh, an area of the law uh, that most attorneys are not familiar with. It was passed in 1851 to protect the shipping industry. It requires that if the defendants are negligent, uh, in order to escape liability, they have to prove that the vessel wasn't unseaworthy and that they did not have foreknowledge of what could occur. We will demolish their limitation of liability action and defenses and hold them accountable on behalf of these victims. There is a, now a July 1st, 2020 deadline. Uh, in most cases, in virtually every case in the system, personal injury or wrongful death claimant has two years to file that claim. Not so with limitation of liability action. The defendant has sought to shorten the period of time in which these families could seek justice. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the areas that we intend to focus on in destroying their limitation of liability action. And I first want to start, okay, we getting feedback? There, we're good. Uh, I want to start first with uh, Nightwatch. <coughs> Federal law, 46 CFR 185. Federal law requires that the owner or operator of a vessel carrying passengers at night has to have a suitable number of watchmen patrol. Uh, this has become more important over the last decade as uh, electronic devices on ships have proliferated, uh, much like on planes. It is one thing to have a roving watch at night when, for example, you could say, nobody's gonna be in the galley cooking anything because it's the middle of the night. Nobody is going to be in the engine room constantly because the engine isn't over underway. But when it comes to ion batteries 
and it, when it comes to charging stations, that risk of fire, particularly on older wooden and fiberglass ships, is something that is with us 24 hours a day. The National Transportation Safety Board report, preliminary report, has concluded that there was no night watch. And that is certainly buttressed uh, by reports that all of the crew was asleep at the time this fire broke out. That is a violation of federal law. There are ways for them to management, manage uh, charging at night. Jeff's going to talk a little bit about that. But the issues that are uh, going to be confronted in this case is what policies did this uh, vessel owner and captain have and were they followed? Uh, there have already been reports from other captains involved with this same company saying there was no systematic night watch. It wasn't part of the company policy. And it was done at an ad hoc basis, usually only when there was bad weather. Um, we are asking that anybody who has information that would be helpful to these families to learn why their loved ones died and to prevent it from happening again, contact us. If you were on that vessel and you could talk to us about Night Watch, call us or email us. If you were on that vessel or a former crew person who's no longer with the company and have information about that or about the charging stations, call us or email us to help these families. I want to last talk about another federal law, and that is 18 U.S.C. 1115. That's a criminal statute. It is known as Siemens manslaughter. Criminal issues for vessels at sea with passengers relying upon their captain, crew, and owner are very different than virtually any other type of liability under criminal and federal law. Criminal liability will attach. Manslaughter will be proven by mere negligence if any of these crew members, captain or owner, was negligent, did not discharge their duties properly, they are subject to potential criminal violation. And I can tell you that that criminal violation for the death of one person is 10 years, not to exceed 10 years. <clears throat> we are familiar with the interplay between criminal and civil liability. Uh, we were the lawyers in the Philadelphia duck boat case that killed two, the Branson, Missouri duck boat case, which killed 17. In both of those, the U.S. Attorney's Office brought criminal charges against those captains. In the Philadelphia case, that captain has pled, uh, had pled uh, guilty, served a year in prison. Uh, the Branson, Missouri duck boat captain has been charged with 17 counts of manslaughter. That case still is pending. Uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to my partner, Jeff Goodman, who's going to talk to you about two of the other core issues in the case, which includes the ion batteries and charging and uh, egress and escapability. When you are on a vessel, fire prevention and fire detection are essential for the very reason that if a fire breaks out, help will not get there in time. It is up to the crew led by the captain to make sure appropriate fire prevention and fire detection policies are in place. Bob spoke about the lack of a night watch which is one of the egregious failures by the captain and by Truth Aquatics in this case. However, there are several others that are uh, also essential. First is the lithium ion batteries. Uh, 
it has been pretty universally reported that the charging stations for these batteries are primarily in the galley. And to give a little more background, we're not just talking about cell phones here. This is sophisticated diving equipment that has tremendous power outputs and requires tremendous charging inputs. You have underwater scooters, underwater video equipment, underwater camera equipment, underwater lighting, all of which relies on lithium ion batteries. Now the benefit of these batteries is that they're rechargeable. That's why we have them in our cell phones. The problem with these batteries is that they can overheat if they are not monitored properly. Uh, in this case, the method that was being used by Truth Aquatics was in no way safety assessed to determine how we should allow the charging for this considerable amount of equipment that our customers and our passengers will need to charge. The problem is if you have one lithium ion battery that starts overheating and it is in contact with others, it will cause them to overheat. If you have a grouping of lithium ion batteries that are in the area where a fire begins, the fire will propagate, it will spread, and it also burns especially hot. Uh, there are numerous ways that a responsible company can make sure that this doesn't occur. There are lithium ion um, charging devices where you keep it in a fire suppressed container. There's fire suppressing bags that are used. There's a variety of fireproofing measures that make sure if there is some incident, this doesn't happen. They're also cheap to do. It's an easy fix and a problem that can be avoided for just a couple hundred dollars. Truth Aquatics, unlike so many others in this industry, chose not to do that. The second main area of concern when it came to once the fire started is how do you get out? These passengers and crew member were below deck. When you are below deck on a vessel, federal law requires two means of egress, two ways to get out for the very reason that in the case of a fire, one of those methods may be blocked. One of those methods may be leading you into the fire. In this case, Truth Aquatics chose through their design of the vessel to have two means of egress that both led to the same place. And in this case, that same place was the galley where the fire began. The failure to have redundancy, different means to get out, gave the victims trapped below deck no way to get out of their bunks, no way to get free of this fire, and resulted in 34 horrific, agonizing deaths of the victims.